There's another ratio that comes from the current ratio that the test likes you to feel comfortable with, and that is called the quick ratio, or the acid test ratio. So it's kind of a funny name. But if you have a business where you own inventory, Inventory is a current asset, but sometimes a business isn't able to sell their inventory in that year time frame, so they have to discount it, sell it, maybe even for less than what they paid for it. So the acid test ratio, or the quick ratio, what they do when you do this ratio is you take current assets and you subtract out inventory because you might not be able to sell that inventory as quickly as you thought you were going to. Divide that by current liabilities. So that's a test question always, the acid test ratio. Current assets minus inventory divided by current liabilities. So when we look at this balance sheet, we've talked about the assets, we've talked about current liabilities. We also need to know within liabilities, we have long-term liabilities. So this is where you would find the debt of the business, the bonds, the money that the business owes that is owed in longer than a year. This last component here, is shareholder equity, shareholder equity. And there's four components to it. I want to give you a visual, something that I think will really help you with this balance sheet equation first before I do shareholder equity. I want to show you, now I'm not an artist, <laughs> it's not my forte. My husband and my children, they're my artists. But if we were to take the assets of the business, assets, they would be equal to the liabilities of the company plus the owner's equity, the shareholder's equity. So I think sometimes that visualization helps students grasp the concept better. Assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. So we've discussed the assets, we've discussed the liabilities. Now we need to know that there are four components to owner's equity, to shareholder's equity. As a publicly traded company, a corporation can issue two different types of stock. So the company can issue common stock or preferred stock. So common stock and preferred stock are two of the components of shareholders' equity. Preferred stock has a par value of $100. Preferred stock always has a par value of $100 because preferred stock has a fixed dividend rate, which we'll discuss later on in another section. So if we just had one share of preferred stock, which is definitely never going to be the case, but for example, one share of preferred stock, we would have a value within shareholders' equity of $100. Common stock, so this is preferred stock at par. Common stock at par is arbitrary, meaning it's not always any dollar amount. It's set by the corporation's board of directors. The common stock's par value could be 50 cents. It could be a dollar. It could be a dollar fifty. It could be two cents. It's whatever the corporation's board of directors chooses it to be. So let's say that when the company had their IPO, their initial public offering, they sold their shares of stock for a public offering price of $30 a share and that the company has decided that the common stock's par value was going to be a dollar. Within shareholders' equity, we have to account for the other $29. It must be accounted for within shareholders' equity, and that's what we call paid in surplus or paid in capital. Paid in surplus or paid in capital is the difference between the par value of the common stock and what it was sold for. So that's where the $29 would go. And the last component of shareholders' equity is 
an important one, and that is called retained earnings. Retained earnings. So there are four components to shareholders' equity. We have to account for the shareholders themselves, so common stock and preferred stock at par. Paid in surplus, which is the difference between the par value and common and what the share was sold at. And then retained earnings. So I, I need to talk about this fourth component of shareholders' equity. Here, so here's our owner's equity. Uh, here's our common stock at par, preferred stock at par, our paid in surplus. And then there's this, this term retained earnings. The dollar amount in the retained earnings category is a flow through item that comes from the company's income statement. So how the balance sheet and the income statement are related is really important. So we're not totally done with our balance sheet discussion. I'm going to do a little bit more there, but I have to show you this. So the income statement, the profit and loss statement, we sometimes call it, in a very general sense, shows us revenue, money that's come in to the company, minus expenses, and I'm going to do more than just this in a minute. When we're done subtracting everything that was paid out, including non-cash expenses like depreciation, the company either has net income or it has a net loss for this time period. So it could be a negative number. The business's net income is money that the company decides to keep. It's what we call undistributed profits. And what it does is it flows through to shareholders' equity and becomes one of the parts of retained earnings. Retained earnings is a cumulative figure. It's a dollar amount that takes into account all of the previous net income or losses of the company for all of the years that that business has been in business. So this is a dynamic number. It's constantly changing. Whereas these first three, they don't change. The only time they change is when the company issues more shares. If they issue more stock, then the common stock at par and paid in surplus would change. If they sold preferred shares, then preferred stock at par would change. So those first three stay the same, but retained earnings is a flow through from the income statement to the balance sheet, and it's, it's constantly changing. It's a dynamic number. So net income is undistributed profits or an undistributed loss, of course. So if we have our basic balance sheet and we know assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity, which really, if I said it 20 times, probably wouldn't be too many for you. And the business did something, let's say they sold $5 million worth of common stock. You could have a question about what happened. So the company sells $5 million worth of common stock Shareholders' equity goes up, so common stock at par would go up, paid in surplus would go up, $5 million. What else would happen? Why do companies sell shares of stock? To raise money, to raise capital. So current assets, specifically cash, would go up as well. So remember, it's a balance sheet. If assets went up, something over here had to go up, or an asset would have had to have gone down so that it would balance. So current assets do go up. So when the company sells shares of stock, what happens to their working capital? It goes up, down, or stays the same. It would go up as well. That's why companies sell securities to raise money, so that they have working capital. What about, what if they, this time they sold uh, $10 million worth of bonds? What would have happened? So they sold $10 million worth of bonds. Their cash goes up. So whether or not they sell equity, stock, or they sell debt, bonds, their cash goes up, so their working capital goes up, and then their long-term liabilities, what happened to those? They went up as well, $10 million. What about if they, say they bought a machine, and they have a loan on their machine 
that they owe $10 million uh, in 10 years. So they bought a $10 million machine, but they took out a loan for that machine. So what of the assets is going to go up? Fixed assets would go up. Fixed assets goes up. So total assets goes up, and then their long-term liabilities would also go up. And the purchasing of this machine on credit, what did it do to their working capital? Nothing. It did not affect their working capital at all. So a couple of questions on the test as far as being able to manipulate the balance sheet. Now we're going to do more on the income statement. I am not going to do a pro forma income statement. There's going to be some things that I'm going to leave out. But what I will cover is what you will need to know for the test. So there's questions about assets and liabilities are found where? Balance sheet. Uh, income is found on the income statement. Expenses are found on the income statement. Dividends paid out are also found on the income statement. So what will we see very at the very top of our income statement is revenue. So the sales volume of the business, so depending upon what they do, maybe they sell cars, so their revenue. We know that we're looking at this over a period of time, generally a year. From the revenue, the very first thing that we're going to expense is what is called cost of goods sold. So the cost associated with the production of those cars, revenue minus cost of goods sold, gives us gross profit. We sometimes call this profit margin. Always a test question. How do you get to gross profit margin? Revenue minus cost of goods sold. If we were to take this dollar amount, gross profit margin, so if we were to take gross profit margin and divide it by revenue, we would end up with our gross profit margin as a percentage. So our, our profit margin as a percentage. And we call this gross because the only thing we've deducted from revenue so far is what? cost of goods sold. We haven't done any other expenses, only the cost directly attributable to the manufacturing of the automobiles in this example. So that's where we start on our income statement. The business is going to have other expenses as well, however, operating expenses that we need to subtract. So there's rent, there's staff, there's insurance, uh, there's lots of different expenses that are not direct, directly attributable to the manufacturing of those automobiles. One of the things that we'll find within operating expenses is depreciation. Depreciation is the concept that I need to cover with you so that you understand that when a business purchases, let's say, a building, the IRS does not let them allow, they don't allow them to write off the cost of the building all at once. No, of course not. The IRS makes them do it over time. So they're going to depreciate fixed assets. They amortize other fixed assets. They deplete natural resources. So they're allowed to write them off over time. So depreciation, depletion, and amortization are non-cash expenses that have the effect of lowering a company's taxable income, even though they didn't directly cost the business any money during that year. Depreciation, amortization, and depletion are operating expenses that are non-cash expenses. You do see them on the income statement. Let me ask you, if you own a home, when you prepare your personal taxes, are you allowed a write-off for your mortgage interest expense? Yes, if you itemize your deductions, you are. The same rule applies for a corporation when they're preparing their taxes. They are allowed to, after operating expenses, they're allowed to deduct the interest that they owe to bondholders. 
So it's a capitalized expense. The interest that they owe to bondholders means it's a write-off, basically. Interest owed to bondholders. So it has the effect of lowering the taxable income. Now the business is going to have to pay its tax bill. So tax is owed. So this is important, the order that these two go in. Interest is paid to bondholders before the IRS gets their taxes. So the interest of the bondholders reduces the taxable income. Then we pay the taxes. Then we need to subtract out preferred stockholders' dividends. When a company has preferred stockholders and common stockholders, they are always required to pay the dividend to the preferred stockholder first. So what we would have here after we subtracted all this is earnings available to common. Earnings available to common stockholders. So when we talk about earnings per share, there's a test question out there that, that wants you to be aware that the earnings available to common stockholders is a dollar amount that you figure out after you've paid preferred, preferred dividends. So we had preferred stock dividends. Those were subtracted out before we got to earnings available to common. So if you knew how many common stockholders there were, you could figure out earnings per share at this point. So if you're an investment analyst that looks at earnings per share, are you a technical analyst or are you a fundamental analyst? You're fundamental because the earnings of a company are found where? On the income statement. So earnings per share come from the income statement. So earnings available to common stockholders, then we're going to pay the common stockholders their dividends. And when all is said and done, we're going to have the net income or the loss. So it could be positive or a negative amount. And this is what the company chooses to keep. Undistributed income. And it flows through into the balance sheet and becomes portion of shareholders' equity called what? Test question. Retained earnings. So the undistributed profits, the net income, flows through to the balance sheet and becomes a component of retained earnings. So basic income statement questions. You'll see as you do the practice questions from the sections and all of the final exams, how complicated the test expects you to uh, be able to understand of questions. They're really not that bad. The cash flow statement. So the income statement and the statement of cash flow. What we had in the income statement were some expenses that were non-cash expenses, like depreciation, depletion, and amortization. And the statement of cash flow, which is also over a period of time, like the income statement, the statement of cash flow is going to adjust for those non-cash expenses. So the, the non-cash expenses are an add-back amount on the statement of cash flow. So depreciation, depletion, and amortization are on the statement of cash flow. Depreciation, depletion, and amortization. But they're positive amounts. So it's highly possible that a business can have a negative income but a positive cash flow because of these non-cash expenses that are found on the income statement. I would say one of the goals of a limited partnership is just that, to have a negative uh, income, a flow through of a loss to the, to the partners, but a positive cash flow. So the statement of cash flow, it's only concerned about the money that comes in and goes out, the cash of the company. If we want to see if the company had a profit, you're going to look at the income statement. If you want to see if they generated cash, look at their statement of cash flow. There's three different components to the statement of cash flow. There's the operating activities, the investing activities, and the finance, financing activities of the company. 
sometimes your test will ha ask you a question about where would you find notes about if the company has changed one of their accounting practices? Or where would you find um, notes about things like unexercised stock options? So really, footnotes, they're, they're important that an investor read them. And the footnotes are found at the bottom of a company's balance sheet. The footnotes are found at the bottom of a company's balance sheet, usually in small type, you know, so the older I get, the harder those are for me to read. Things like income taxes broken down by level would be found there. Information about their pension plans and any other retirement programs would also be found there. So the footnotes are found at the bottom of what financial statement? The balance sheet. Some other financial ratios that we need to feel comfortable with include debt to equity. So the debt to equity ratio helps to measure a company's leverage. Debt to equity. So total liabilities, total liabilities divided by shareholders equity. So if we talk about leverage financing, leverage financing is the issuance of debt. So this helps us to measure leverage. Total liabilities, that's where we'd find the company's debt. Their debt to equity, shareholders equity ratio. So if a company has a debt to equity ratio of two to one, it means that the company has two dollars of debt for every dollar a shareholder invests in the company. In other words, the company's taking on twice as much debt as far as twice as much as the com as the people that are investing in the company. The price earnings ratio is an important fundamental ratio, PE. When you look at a PE ratio of a business, you have to compare that ratio with another uh, company in the same industry. You can't look at the PE ratio of a technology company and compare compare it to a clothing manufacturing P.E. ratio. They're only comparable within the same industry. So price per share divided by earnings per share. Price per share. So could you have a question on how do you do this? Absolutely. Price per share divided by earnings per share. Also a question as to fundamental analysts. Look at P.E. ratios. So have you heard the term growth stock? Growth stocks have what kind of P.E. ratios, generally speaking, high or low? Growth stocks have high, generally speaking, high price earnings ratios. So if a company had a P.E. ratio of 10 to 1, that would mean that the company's stock is selling at 10 times its earnings. So if it had a price per share of $20 and earnings per share of 2, that would give you your P.E. ratio of 10 to 1. So price earnings ratios. Only relative within the same industry. We talked about the current ratio. How did we get to the current ratio? We took current assets and divided it by what? Current liabilities. That gave us the current ratio. Measurement of a company's ability to withstand a short-term economic downturn. And then if we wanted to take the current ratio and we wanted to make it the quick ratio or the acid test ratio, what would we need to subtract out? Inventory. If we subtract out inventory, then that is no longer the current ratio. No, it's the acid test or the quick ratio, because you might not be able to sell your inventory as quickly as you thought. So a couple of questions on how to read the financials. You need to have a basic understanding of each of them, and, and I promise you, you have a couple of questions as far as each of them go, and as far as understanding these ratios that we went over. 
The SEC requires publicly traded companies to file certain reports with them. There is an annual report that is required to be filed. It's called a 10K. Unaudited quarterly reports must also be filed with the SEC. Those are called 10Qs. The 10K is due 90 days after year end, and 10Qs are due 45 days after quarter end. Publicly traded companies also must file a Form 8K whenever a significant event that affects the corporation should happen, such as a pending merger, pending bankruptcy, or changes in the control of the company. Form 8K is due with the SEC within four business days after the occurrence of the event. Broker-dealers are required to file reports with the SEC. Electronically, they're called FOCUS reports. FOCUS stands for Financial and Operational Combined Uniform Single Report. The broker-dealer files these reports with the SEC and with FINRA. If it is a clearing broker-dealer, the broker-dealer has a $250,000 net capital requirement and is required to file the FOCUS Part 2 by the 17th day after month end, as well as a focus part two by the 17th business day after quarter end. And detailed financial statements are also required to be filed for clearing broker dealers. If it's a non-clearing broker dealer firm, focus 2A is required to be filed with FINRA and the SEC by the 17th business day after quarter end, but they are not required to file monthly reports. Broker-dealers that are non-clearing firms and affect more than 10 trades a year out of their proprietary trading account are subject to a minimum net capital of $100,000. They are also required to file monthly Focus 2A reports in addition to quarterly filings when they are non-clearing firms that affect more than 10 trades a year out of their proprietary accounts. The Focus 2A that's required by the non-clearing broker-dealers, it's also required by limited part limited partnership dealers, and investment company dealers within 17 business days of quarter end. If a broker-dealer should be subject to termination of membership, a Focus 2 or, or Focus 2A is required to be filed with the SEC and with FINRA, which is the designating examining authority, within two business days of termination. I do not expect that those reports will be a big emphasis on your test, but at least you know what an 8K is, you know what the 10K is, you know what the 10Q is, you know what focus reports stand for and who files them, broker-dealer firms. A mutual fund has shareholders, and mutual funds are required to deliver shareholder statements twice a year, a semi-annual and an annual report. So to the mutual fund shareholders, they get the annual report, which has audited financial statements, and a semi-annual report where the financial statements are unaudited. Anytime you sell a new issue under the Securities Act of 1933, you are required to give out a prospectus. A prospectus is a summary of the registration statement. You must give it out whenever you sell a new issue. The latest you can give out a prospectus is the due date of confirmation. The confirmation is sent the business day after the trade date. There is a rule that the SEC has that's called access equals delivery. So for many of these financial statements that must be provided to your customers, so long as your customer has internet access and the forms are available online, that is sufficient. With one exception, they do not allow internet delivery of a prospectus for investment company offerings. Within this section, we have a discussion on what is called the time value of money and the concept of something important called net present value. I have this girlfriend. I have an, an accounting background. I already told you that. And Every time January, January rolls around, she's so excited to file her taxes. Okay, who in their right mind is excited to file their taxes? My girlfriend. Because every year she gets money back. And it makes me laugh year after year after year. So she doesn't understand a really important concept. What is the concept that she does not, no matter how many times I explain it to her, understand? Time value of money. 
It's this idea that she's giving a loan to the government for free. So how much, you know, how much should you pay during the year as far as withholding for your taxes? Just enough to not owe any money and to not get any money back. So she looks at it like this ooh, bonus she gets in the mail from the IRS every year. But I try to explain to her that if you're going to get the $2,000 refund after you file your taxes in the future, when you when I give you a choice of getting that $3,000, would you rather have it now or later? Well, she obviously chooses to get it later, but the rest of us, those of us with a right sense about this, would always choose to get the money now. So money in the future is worth less than the money would be today. The same $3,000 today is going to go further as far as purchasing power than the $3,000 will in a year because what happens to how much things cost, generally speaking, over time is they get more expensive. That's called, of course, inflation. So if I give you a choice of $3,000 today or $3,000 in a year, you're going to say you want it now. It's a time preference. If I'm going to give you the ability that I'll pay you later, what do you want? More or less money. You want more money if you have to get the money in the future. You're going to want more than $3,000. So you want $3,500 if I pay you later on in the future. So there's this idea that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar is in the future. So usually what's going to happen in the real world is you're going to have computer programs that will look at how much it costs a client to get into an investment, what are the future cash flows that are generated by the investment, discounts those future cash flows back to their present value, and tells you, is it a good investment for your client? But on the test, you don't have that computer program to help you do that. So conceptually, you have to understand what goes into that program to determine whether or not this is a worthwhile investment for your client. You don't get a financial calculator, so we don't actually have to learn the full formula, although I'll show it. It's within the PDF portion of the course, but I don't have to teach you the whole thing. This is a class that a lot of people drop out of business school over as far as that math formula goes, so don't worry about that. You don't have to know that, but you do have to understand conceptually what goes into this calculation, what it is that you're looking at, what it is that you're figuring out when you're making a decision as far as is this a good investment for your client. It's also possibly something that a corporation is going to look at in deciding should they spend their money on this piece of machinery or should they put their money somewhere else where they could earn uh, whatever their cost of capital is, so 3% or 5% or 10% or 12% or whatever it is that they could earn with this money. Should they use the money to buy a new machine or should they invest this money somewhere else? So this concept of net present value. It's important to remember that net present value is a dollar amount. It is not a rate of return, and I'll show you through this example. You will see that. Anytime the net present value of the investment is positive, it's an acceptable investment. If the net present value is negative, it is not an acceptable investment. If the net present value is zero, then the discount rate being used is the investment's internal rate of return, which I'll go over. Net present value is defined as the difference between the initial cost outlay and present value of expected cash inflows. A positive net present value is acceptable. We said the net present value of zero is the investment's internal rate of return, and a negative net present value signals that it's not a worthy investment. So let's look at an example. So within the PDF, we have an example where we look at, so you can see the formula. It takes into account the initial cost outlay and the future cash flows of this investment. So it says, in the net present value example, it says that the initial cost outlay is going to be $10,000. So to get into this investment, it costs you $10,000. But it's going to create money in, in the future. So your cash inflows at the end of the next four years are $5,000, $4,000, $3,000, and $1,000. $5,000, 
4,000, 3,000, and 1,000. So add all those up for me. 13,000, basic math. They do give you a basic non-programmable calculator. Use it. Don't get it wrong because you forgot how to add. There's some important concepts in here. The $13,000 that you're going to get in the future, the dollars in the future, if I offered you those dollars today, would I offer you more or less money? If there's $13,000 that you could get in the future, the dollars today would be what? More or less? Less. There's this idea that the dollar today is worth more than the dollar is in the future. So the $13,000 in the future is worth less today. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to take that future cash flow and we're going to have to, using a discount rate, discount it back to its net present value. We have to use a discount rate to do that. But I want to start off with not using a discount rate at all. So I want to start off with a zero discount rate, if you will. So if the discount rate used is none, not one at all, when we look at this investment, it cost $10,000 to get into the investment. We created a positive cash flow of $13,000, the net present value without a discount rate. So not discounting the future cash flow to its present value. We have a positive net present value of $3,000. And that would signal that it's a worthwhile investment for the client. Anytime it's positive, it's a worthwhile investment for the client. But you would never use a zero discount rate. I only use the zero discount rate because it helps you understand a really important concept. So when we use a discount rate of zero, so if the discount rate used is zero, you will have the highest net present value. If the discount rate that you use is zero, that will yield you the highest net present value. If that is true, which it is, this is also true, and this is a really important truism. The higher the discount rate, the higher the discount rate, the what the net present value? The lower the net present value. The higher the discount rate, the lower the net present value. That is a super important concept, and it makes sense. The way that I explained it always gets everybody's light bulbs to go off. It makes me so happy. So if you use zero discount rate, you'll have the highest net present value. So if you don't use one at all. So the higher the discount rate, the lower the net present value will be. Test question. The higher the discount rate, the lower the net present value will be. So there's a couple of examples in the PDF that I want to show you. So remember, you do not have a financial calculator. You do not have a table of present value factors. The only thing that you can be tested on is conceptually, do you understand how this works? Do you understand that if the discount rate goes up, the net present value goes down? Do you understand that? Do you understand that a positive net present value is acceptable for the client, whereas a negative net present value is not? That's what the test is going to want you to understand.